This episode of Marketing Smarts is brought to you by Localytics. Welcome back to Marketing Smarts, a podcast brought to you by Marketing Profs. I'm your host, Kerry O'Shea Gorgone, and I'm about to leave for a water aerobics class, which is why I'm wearing my SPF swim shirt. That's the kind of personal detail and authenticity that today's guest Chris Brogan often includes in his Sunday morning email newsletter. That's just one of the things we're going to talk about today. Chris is the CEO of Owner Media Group, where he creates simple plans and projects for business success. He's also the New York Times bestselling author of eight books, including Trust Agents and The Impact Equation. I invited Chris to Marketing Smarts to talk about his forthcoming book, Insider, Strategies and Secrets for Business Growth in the Age of Distraction. I also wanted to talk to him about how he's used content marketing and email marketing to successfully launch Owner Media Group. I'm so excited to have Chris back with us today. Chris, thanks so much for talking with me. Carrie, so glad to be with you. Thank you. Oh, it's always fun talking with you. So you are doing some incredible things with Owner Media Group. Well, I don't know, maybe. Uh, but <laughs> well, I mean, I like them. So, <laughs> thank you. One of the things I'm doing is I just launched a, a media platform called Owner Fuel, and the idea is at ownerfuel.com. And the idea was that um, my company's brand is tied really tightly to my name, and people, you know, don't usually know the name Owner Media Group or Owner. And I was like, huh, I probably need to build something so that maybe it could live a little bit beyond me. And so I've launched Owner Fuel. I still write in the first person. I still write as if it's me writing it and it's different when I had owner magazine and I had like 20 something authors but um, what I decided was that you know I, someday I would love for it to be like something like BuzzFeed where no one knows who built that you know or, or you know Gawker enough people from the inside know it's Nick Denton uh, but not many people from the outside actually know or remember that anymore so you I guess don't, I'm just you don't want to be owners uh, Pete Cashmore like every time I I'd don't. see Mashable I'd be like Pete Cashmore yeah, but you see, that's, I think that's inside baseball at this point. Like, I think so many people now show up at Mashable and they've never ever, you know, heard his name or something, and they don't know that he looks a bit like Zoolander. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's this new world. But I, I, yeah, it's the weirdest thing in the world. Everyone else is worried about people don't know who they are, and I'm like, I'm trying to tamp it down a little over there. You're really all in though, because I saw on Twitter on your own account you were saying, "Unfollow me here." and go follow me over at the handle for owner because we're going to be doing some amazing things. What is that handle, by the way? It's just at owner fuel and also facebook.com slash owner fuel. I think I also own Pinterest, but I quite literally have done zero with it. Except You're for, not into pinning? I, you know, I, I am. I, and I have a private Ryan Gosling board just like every nice person on Pinterest does. And I have sure. one for... Uh, uh, salad in a jar. I saw that go by on Instagram the other day. If we're eating salad out of a jar, it's probably Instagram, uh, Pinterest's um, fault. I eat salad out of the bag. There you go. It's horrible. I When I was clerking, a judge came in and said, you know, Carrie, we have bowls. <laughs> like, Why do I need it? Put the thing, the dressing in there. Skip the middleman. Get up. You yeah. That's just, that's just dishes. Why reducing, would we want that? reducing my carbon footprint. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. What I noticed about what you're doing now, you're very, well, you've always been very free about sharing information, but the yeah. stuff that you're putting out now, I saw this blog post about fast product launch that you put out on August 31st, and it was very, very detailed down to tools and platforms, and it was like exactly how you had accomplished this whole relaunch in two days. And of course, I thought that's pretty fantastic information, and I shared it everywhere. I could see where some people would say, Chris, you're kind of giving away the store, right? This is what you're theoretically going to charge people to learn how to do, but really you're laying it out for them in a blog post that they can freely disseminate. So how do you respond to people like that that say you're giving away everything? Uh, so first off, it's, it's, a, it's a great problem to have. I mean, it would be wonderful for people to have, uh, you know, the worry that people were coming in droves to take away the content that I provide and, you know, that they're going to go, this is so useful, I got to get more. Right. Like I, I hope that day comes for me. But um, the thing is, there's always more to talk about. I mean, when I look at that post, that specific post, they're the little seven items that, you know, this is exactly the process are enough for some people and they can just run with that. And that's not my buyer anyway. That's just someone I can help, you know, get a, a simple frame in place. 
the person who's my buyer is the one who goes, wait, 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 slow down here, slow down. I need to know, what did you mean in step three? That's who is going to maybe want to buy a little plan for me. Or uh, if it goes a little bit bigger, then it's a whole project. So this is our, our language around owner now is that we provide plans and products for simple business success. So I think the whole idea or simple plans and projects for business success. Um, I think the whole concept is that people are tired of reading sort of what if theoretical blog posts and content. They're tired of reading, you could go do this if you want. So I've been giving them flat out recipes. I just did one for how to, how to quite literally how to find the time to blog. And it was the same thing. I was saying, come get it. Like, you know, you've got to learn this stuff. And then I will always have at least one layer, sometimes two layers of more information that I can provide if someone wants to go deeper. And if they don't, then I didn't want their time or their money anyway. Well, you've talked in the past about time quilting, and it sounds like that's something that I'm sure you use it, obviously, but I'm sure that's something that other people could use. So they're sitting places like in the car line at school, which can be a solid hour, or, you know, at the gym in between sets while somebody else is using the machine they want, that kind of thing. You can actually put down ideas for blog posts, or I just retooled a course that I'm working on for marketing profs, and I was doing it while I was waiting in the car with sticky notes. Actually, sticky notes I got from you at the last conference you did. You had some leftover sticky notes. So, <laughs> so thank you. I owe you for those. Um, so time quilting is something that I think we could all learn a little something from. Do you still use that, like, every day? Every or? day. Every day. Uh, you know, I'm in the middle of writing a book while we're doing this recording, and I, as an idea will come up, I'll throw something into a, a part of Evernote, for instance, and remind me to go back and write this concept. Um, for my business, I do it too. I, I had an idea about... Um, I'm going to rebuild my primary website. I was thinking there's going to be these four different kinds of offerings. And I said, oh, no, there's a fifth one. And I was like, oh, I have to rearrange all this. So it's fun because we tend to think we don't, quote, have the time because we're looking for uninterrupted blocks of an hour or two hours or something or even a half hour. And sometimes we have three minutes and sometimes we have four and a half minutes or something like that. And I think that we use that poorly you know, I, I, one of my favorite things of my own that I quote, and I almost never quote myself, is, you know, we treat money as if it's finite and time as if it's not. And I think that, you know, it's amazing how much time we waste. And believe me, there's days I'm intentionally burning as much time as I can. I'm just playing Xbox and having a great day. But that's by choice. But when we think we don't have enough time to get everything done and we're panicking, that's usually because we're poor, we're really poor at investing. Or because we kept words with friends on our phone. Yeah, you know, there is that. Uh, I, I just actually deleted this other one called 2048 uh, because I, I don't know how to get further than just getting a 2048 on my screen. And I've just decided that maybe I could do other things with my time, like read books again. <laughs> Instead of staring at it. One of the courses that you have is all about actually developing courses, which is kind of meta. So it's like a course that teaches you how to develop an online course. But what I was thinking is it would be great for brand marketers to create courses that train their existing clientele on using maybe complex products and services like software as a service kind of thing better so that they use the stuff, you know, and come back for another turn on the subscription wheel because a lot of times they'll have these really complicated things and people are like, no, that's, that's too much for me. But it seems to me at least that a whole nother audience for you could be brand marketers for, you know, learning basically how to use their stuff. Is that something that you thought about? It's a, it's a great uh, application of it. We've had some of the graduates of Online Course Maker go and do something like that. And it's really fun because there's – uh, people are using it in so many different ways. Some people are using it to make free email subscription autoresponder type drips. Other, you know, for so for marketing. Some people are using it for internal training. Some people are using it. Uh, one person was using it as a way to write a book outline because it's very heavy on using table of contents kind of a mindset. And so, um, which I said, I have a whole other course for that. <laughs> Why that? Yeah, really. Um, but it, it's funny because. So I, I came up in business in the uh, early 90s, and there was a big push to buy a learning management system uh, in my wireless telecom. And so I was the poor soul who had to implement it. And it was like almost a half a million bucks. And it was a lot of you know proprietary software. And any kind of change we wanted took a huge process to get it done. And a lot of people have some sort of bad experience with a learning management system in some old business. Or they did one online course you know, from their college back when that was in the dinosaur days. 
days. And even today, like uh, my fiance Jacqueline is, you know, finishing off her PhD and I look over her shoulder at some of the learning tools that she has to use and I, I want to die. So the other thing that makes Online Course Maker kind of cool is we're, we're sort of platform agnostic. You could use it on any platform, but we show you some really simple ways to do it. And I think that that's where the big win can be is that, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be so heavyweight. It can be very lightweight and still uh, deliver value to the people who you need to serve. Well, the tool you use, Rainmaker, seems really versatile. It actually can even incorporate a podcast, which is something else that you do is podcast. I think that more people should be podcasting. It's just my opinion. It doesn't do me any good if they do, of course. It's like more competition, but I feel like there's so much room. Um, anybody can do it. Is that something that you act actively encourage businesses to do if you work with them? Uh, so podcasting is something that I put into a category that I call um, attention assets. And I tell people to create assets that earn them attention that they can then hopefully convert to people on their newsletter list. So creating attention assets includes podcasting because out of all the other types of media, you, you know, we, we tend to, we almost want to use the word mediums, but I guess quite grammatically it's, it's media. like seances and spirits and stuff. <sighs> Terrible. Um, <laughs> so out of all the different ways that you could reach somebody podcast is kind of unique because you could stick an earbud in and be walking around the grocery store. You could have the kid watching their, their baby TV show or something, and you could still be listening. So you can consume it on your commute, uh, walking the dog, all those kinds of places. So it's a much more consumable media than text. The thing is it eats much more time. So, uh, people's podcast is a half an hour. Then it takes you a half an hour to consume it. Or, you know, you push the Put one, two times. half time speed or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, it's not as fast as reading, and especially if you're a fast reader. So I, to me, it's an option that some people use for the wrong reasons. It's an option that some people could use to great benefit if they uh, paid better attention to brevity and to delivering something that matches somebody's particular learning and, and uh, growth needs. So like the rest of your content, it has to be carefully thought out as far as goal and audience and format and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, what's what's you know what's your business goal? What's the person who's going to consume its goal? Uh, how do you both get something out of it? Uh, one of the things that I sort of snuck into the how to find more time in the blog was that point is that if you're going to bother writing, it better do something for the person that you serve. If you're yes. going to bother writing, it better do something for you. Uh, you know, so if it doesn't do for both, then don't even start writing. So I think the same for podcasting or all the other media you create is it has to have some kind of value. Some of it could be non-converting media, as I call it, which means I'm not really trying to sell you something. But it could be, again, like an attention asset, which is earning me the right to offer a converting media. So I have sort of a three to one, you know, three, hey, look at my sweaty gym selfie type thing to like, I'm now going to sell you something. And, and I find you should that sell one, sweaty gym selfies. I could do that or I could sell like in a calendar. Clothes. I've got a wagon full of them over here that need to get laundered. So, <laughs> Oh, boy. Uh, so three yeah. to one ratio. Yep. So I think, you know, uh, three sort of I'm not really trying to sell you some things to every I'm going to sell you something. And and by the way, sell can be something just gentle. Get on my list. Go follow my platform. You know, whatever it is that you need them to do. But you're, you're trying to, you know, like in basic on, you know, old fashioned sales, you're trying to advance the cause forward. So to me, there's there's kind of four big concepts, you know, uh, you're trying to grow your platform, grow your list in some way, which I specifically mean your email newsletter list. Are you trying to nurture the people that are already on it? Are you trying to convert somebody or are you trying to retain or refer? Which is, I, I sort of mix that category because if you're real estate, then you're looking for referrals. If you are, uh, something like a membership site or something like a subscription service and you want to retain. You've talked about how email is really the bread and butter of your business, and some of your emails, especially the ones that go out the, right before the class or a webinar is about to happen, are some of your best for conversion, right? Yes. Uh, we've, we've learned that everything that you hate about email is still accurate and true and very <laughs> important. Uh, you know, if I send out a last call or last chance type email, it converts massively. So we'll send out a sales letter on, say, a Tuesday. We'll send out a reminder uh, at the end of uh, Rob's newsletter on Thursday. I'll add another one on Sunday. I might send another one, uh, you know, Friday before that Sunday newsletter. And then on the day, say that the, it's say it's a Tuesday to Tuesday cycle. So on Tuesday the 1st, I'm starting this mess. And on Tuesday the 8th, I'm trying to reap the rewards. On the 8th, I can send up to three messages if I, I measure based on who did or didn't open. If you didn't open, I'll send you more mail. 
And I can tell you that it is upwards of between 40 to 80% of all the revenue we pick up is on the last day, the last call email. So your audience are procrastinators. Yeah. And I, and I, I would say that it's not uncommon for most audiences to have a similar uh, experience. Although I would say that because I very specifically serve people uh, who are digital minded uh, and marketers, a lot of them and salespeople, there is no one more procrastinating than marketers and salespeople and entrepreneurial Procrast, types. Procrastinating. That's a word. Oh, you you had one email that made you, what was it, like $8,000? Just that one. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, so I, I make... I, <laughs> We, we did a whole run where we made about 189000 total uh, over eight days with a handful of emails. And uh, that was kind of a nice day given that it was uh, some of the product price points were two, uh, $20, some were $100, et cetera. So you got to divide that you know, into 180 to go, wow, that's not a bad day. But yeah, we've had um, some really neat projects where we've launched something and it's come out pretty uh, successfully for us. 8,000 is at this point kind of a slow day uh, for us. And, and it, that sounds so braggy. A little, uh, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, but well, I mean, but people you would be jumping that- for joy. Some of my colleagues are now saying, you know, that when they do their launches, they make seven million dollars in a launch or something like that. And I'm not anywhere near that. But I can tell you that, um, you know, it sort of depends. I mean, my list size is awful small because we call it all the time too. We kill every six months. We we uh, put people on a path that says it doesn't look like you're opening these, and then we give them a little chance to respond to that. And if they don't, we kick them out. And the reason we do is because we respect everyone's inbox. We would like people to actually care and want to use the mail. I grew up uh, watching my dad just collect and hoard thousands of emails that he never read. He was like an IT guy that just kept getting tons and tons of email. He, he still does. You know, he's got like 81,000 unread emails, a whole bunch of them on how to implement Windows servers. And he plays poker in Vegas. So, <laughs> you know, I just don't want to be that. I don't want to be your eight unread burden. And so I just help people not have that problem. And that keeps my list very small and makes the open rate a lot higher. Your Sunday newsletter is one of my favorites. It's actually some of the favorite content that I get from any source during the week. Talk more about that because it's a little bit different from the rest of your content. It's a little more personal, right down to what you're drinking when you write it. Yes. So uh, there's a few pieces of mechanics into that. So the reason I ask people what I'm drinking, uh, what they're drinking, this is a pineapple type (laughs) thing. Juice. It is not in any way really a pineapple. Mmm. Pumpkin. And coffee. I want some Dunkins. America runs on that, I'm told. Uh, the reason I ask that question is there's an actual tactical reason. Uh, if you don't really know what you can or can't talk about with regards to the body of the rest of the letter, maybe you don't feel smart enough or qualified enough to say anything, you could probably tell me what you're drinking. So I'm encouraging and eliciting a response. Uh, and it's become a thing, though. So I'll go to an event and somebody will ask me, but what are you drinking? Or if I don't put it in there, but what are you drinking? And I like it because there's sort of a kind of call and response nature to it. You know, it's like Catholic Church. You sit, stand, kneel. You know what you're supposed to say right after they say their thing. Um, And I think that the ritualization of it, it it was surprising to me that people uh, respond to it and want it. So that's one reason. The reason the content is much more personal is because I'm trying to build a relationship-minded kind of business where this is behind the velvet rope because I want to treat your inbox like it's the most special relationship we have. I, the last thing I want you to do is say, can I find this somewhere else on the web? And that's where most people's newsletters are. It's just a rehash of junk that's all over, everywhere else. The uh, last and final part of that uh, recipe is that I make sure that I try to keep my best content, my best free content on that Sunday newsletter so that you can start to get this sort of anticipatory feeling. And I always love that experience because, you know, it is still an email marketing newsletter. I'm, st- I'm selling something. So I love when people say to me, I didn't get my newsletter today. What happened? you know, you didn't sell to me today. (laughs) What better? I mean, what universe am I living in? And that's what people are saying to me. And and I'm grateful for that. So that's why I try. But I also tell people that, you know, if you make your newsletter kind of the secret ingredient of your marketing and sales experience, you're going to have a a way better success rate than any other platform. And the numbers just so far just keep proving that. Subject lines. How do you come up with your subject lines? Oh, you know what? Two and a half years ago, James Altucher said that I was a really crappy copywriter. He was saying it with love. He was like, <laughs> you're, you're, he goes, you're like me. You're like not a good copywriter and you should pay attention to like Claudia because she's really good. So like, yeah, you're totally right. Brian Clark says I'm awful too. Like, you know, there's, there's a line of people waiting to tell me how bad a copywriter I am. I didn't say they and, were bad. <laughs> no, no, I know. 
so uh, so I worked on it. You know, I, like any uh, you know anyone who kind of has ego about their craft. I mean, I am a writer. I'm an author. So I was like, oh, I better write better subject lines. So we. <laughs> You're an author. Discovered. That's your book back there. That's one of my books. I know that yeah. one. Impact Equation. We uh, came to learn some things, Rob Hatch and I at Owner. And one of them is that as much as I would love to be... Uh, okay, so so several things I don't do. I don't write I don't write subject lines that say seven ways to get better at something. I don't write numbered anything kind of posts if I can help it. Every now and again, I'll throw it in a lot of times just to be funny or sarcastic. But um, it's because we don't talk like that. Content marketing talks like that. Um, I make my subject line something that I'm hoping is going to convince you to open it, if only because I've jarred you a little mentally to say, I don't, hmm, what's this one mean? I've also the, uh, gone through the effort, though, to make sure that I don't do those kind of um, personalizing shock type ones. Carrie, did you forget this? You know, and, and those ones drive me insane. Or, Carrie, can I have your help for a second? You know, those, I hate them because I, I always fall for it. And it's always like, will you go vote for me on this iTunes review? And I'm like, I want to stab you. Like, I thought, like, you wanted something from me. So oh, like, really me? Yeah. Technical term, right? I thought, you know, you meant me, not, you know, me, the marketing. Not me. You didn't want my wallet. Um, <laughs> so I do that. The other thing I do with subject lines is I've, I've experimented a bunch. And I think emotional minded subject lines seem to have the best drag. And the, I, I, I'm a database kind of person. I'm, 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 I'm very much of mind that we should be showing people good numbers and good skills and stuff like that. Uh, emotions win 100% of the time over me trying to tell somebody a story with, say, like numbers or data. So my, uh, my stuff now talks a little bit more like, you know, start with the win or my year of not knowing or I'm not a guru or with love to spare. You know, so I, I try to make them a lot more emotional punch than I do, you know, seven ways blab will change your life. Blab, though, you've actually tried that. And Periscope, streaming video. It's like you try it, but you hate yourself for trying it when I watch you on those. It's a lot like a moped. Um, you don't want anyone <laughs> to see you on it. Oh, no. um, so I can tell you that I, I'm not fond of live video streaming as a process and a project. And I know everyone and their brothers writing about how great it is. And I'll, I'll tell you, there's a bunch of mechanics at hand for this. So I'm not into it because my job is to advise business owners how to spend their time. So if I'm going to help you try to add money to your pocket uh, or as your company to build your revenue, it is a horrible use of your time to go on a live video stream and talk people up and hope a couple of them grab your newsletter or click through a link or something like that. You can totally make it work. I, I got 10 people to buy a course of mine on Periscope in an hour, so I made like five grand in that hour. But in an hour, and, you could have sent an email. Yeah. You know. I mean, I could have sent one email that maybe some people ignored, but they were so interested in the novelty that they pulled out their credit card. And uh, eight of the people were strangers, which, by the way, again, when I talk about attention assets, Live video streaming is an attention asset. So what's wrong with it? It's 1987. There's a reason we love DVRs. There's a reason we have Netflix. There's a reason we get stuff on Prime. Live anything is complex. You know, your your 2 p.m. is not my 2 p.m., et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of challenges to it. Also, making something live means no editing. It means you have to actually be a pretty good host. You have to do things like eye contact. Uh, there's a lot of challenges to it. That said, of the platforms, I, I'm still not in any way interested in Periscope. Uh, Jacqueline and I used it to watch behind the scenes at Impractical Jokers. That's about it so far. Um, I can tell you that Blab is slightly more interesting because you can sort of do a talk show format and have guests and panel and stuff like that. But are they here to stay? I don't have any argument. I don't care. I, I can tell you I know many, many CEOs of companies from videos, uh, live streaming video companies who are no longer CEOs of live streaming video companies. I know many. So I can tell you that they're, you know, it's nothing's a sure bet. But I would say that, you know, should you be looking at them? I don't advise it. I, unless you are very specifically a media business and you actually make your money just with attention, then it's just not necessarily the best way to spend your time to get some revenue to your company. Or maybe I guess if you're at the point where, you know, you've just got, you're swimming in money and you've got tons to spare. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, if you're the kind of person who buys, you know, like, like Coke or something like that, and they're like, yeah, we'll buy a handful of billboards in this town for uh, sports teams because it helps give back or something. I mean, if you've got some discretionary funds that you can put towards a project like this, it doesn't hurt. I mean, uh, SAP sponsored Brian Fanzo's uh, Blab the other day, and I thought it was actually kind of probably a good use of their money. 
because it, at least somebody would pay attention to Fanzo and they wouldn't necessarily want to listen to an ad from SAP. So they got their face and name on to a, a new pl uh, platform in a good way. Yeah. So there's that. So. Yeah. Your books, Trust Agents, The Impact Equation, which is back here on the shelf, and The Freak Shall Inherit the Earth, they all espouse related, you know, but slightly different principles for building your audience, building your brand, your business. Do you follow those principles still? How are they evolving as you grow owner media? I do. You know, uh, what's kind of interesting, uh, I, I go through phases of which of my own books I like the most. Uh, there's ones I will never read again, like Google Plus for Business. Thank you for the check. Like, you know, that was uh, that was a financial transaction. Um, although I did really believe that Google Plus was going to be huge because how couldn't it be the biggest, you know, tech company backed it and that we all know how that went. Good job, Logan. <laughs> so, uh, you know, things can not be We could have just not brought it up. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I always like to start with the wounds. But I can tell you, uh, trust agents still definitely applies. I mean, there, some of the names have been changed to protect the innocent at this point. You know, it's several years later, so XYZ person doesn't work at ABC Company anymore. But the premise is 100% on, you know, um, make your own game. That is still, you know, make your own marketing segment. When people talk about niching, I say don't. Make a segment that has nothing to do with the existing map, and then you're, you're already top of that segment. Um, uh, be, uh, be agent zero. Connect all kinds of people together. I mean, that's an important thing. Build an army. I say at the end of Trust Agents, Julian and I say um, that if you don't really gather up and you're just sort of units of one, you're going to collapse back down again because business just, you know, you can't sustain it. And we've seen a lot of our friends have to go and find a day job because they can't quite make that all work as solo entities. And yet, if they'd sort of conglomerated a little bit, they might have had a, an alliance of sorts. They might have gone a little further. So I think that the books still hold up. Uh, I use impact equation a lot because that equation, just writing the word create and then using it like equalizer knobs, I, it makes me think really quickly, all right, uh, that's why I launched Owner Fuel. I was like, I need more reach and I need more exposure. So I launched Owner Fuel to, as an impact equation thing. Freaks is my book about entrepreneurship. Um, I live that one every day. So I, I can't say enough about that book. That's a book that I wish more people would have read because I think they mistook it as thinking, well, I have a day job. I can't read about entrepreneurship. And it's just really about kind of how to guide your life no matter what desk you're sitting at. I think they should read it. There's still time. A lot of times the books that are really good do find their audience over time. So I have confidence in you. Thank um, you. You're welcome. So we've reached the part of the podcast where we're going to talk about anything but marketing. And for you, I have a very specific question. Go. <sighs> oh, how fun. Hawkeye versus Deadpool. Who do you think would win? Uh, sadly, Deadpool wins. Um, he's, you know, he's endlessly regenerative. Uh, he can break the fourth wall, which Hawkeye doesn't have that opportunity. Uh, he has several magic like powers, like the ability to produce swords out of thin air. You know, I know Dead I, 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 my visceral reaction was the same, but Hawkeye is very street. So I don't know. Mm. Very yeah. Smart. You know, Hawkeye has that same thing that Batman has of if there's a way to sort of break all logic and, and pull, pull a win out of nowhere, it would be Hawkeye that probably would get that done in Marvel. No, of course, it's never really going to end because of the regenerative powers that Deadpool mm. has. So I guess we'll see that over and over and over again. So you're a comic book guy, obviously. I like the comics. How have has been, well, how have the comic lore, if you will, um, helped you to form your approach to life and business. It's it's funny because I've I've been thinking about so Batman's my favorite and I've been thinking about it a lot lately and and by the way the least interesting part is the billionaire part it's just the fact that he was able to train himself and like you know go get really physically fit and uh, be a scientist and be a detective. He had and all time to do that because he was a billionaire. Well, you're right. <laughs> you are and related. It wasn't exactly like, you know, punching clock at Chuck E. Cheese or something. I mean, my little, you killed my parents. Oh, hang on. I got to go to this birthday party. Uh, but, you know, I think when I think about it now, I just think, man, what a what a weird dude. Like he has billions of dollars, but he basically drives a very expensive car around so that he can punch people individually. Like he didn't bother to build like a police force up. He just wants to punch all a lot of people at once. So I can hit many people you know, but one at a time. I'll go it's get just you. inefficient. <laughs> yeah. So comics, you know, a lot of comics don't stand up. But what I like is that the um, 
you know, Batman reminds us to be brave. Superman reminds us to be bigger than ourselves. You know, Hulk reminds us that, you know, there's always a strong person inside us that can fight back if we're feeling like the little guy. Comics all have these storylines that remind us that, you know, we're not alone. And there's, there's humankind's greatest need is the need to feel wanted. I think right after that, one of the phrases that makes us feel most safe and warm in life is you are not alone. Uh, because we like to sort of sense that mirror around us. And so comics shaped me in that way. Comics actually just, you know, baseline taught me how to read. I mean, I was picking them up from ages three and four, and I read very early because of comics, because I wanted to know the stories beyond just the panel. So what I love about them still is that, you know, they've actually in a weird way morphed into sort of storyboards for what's going to be made into a movie. Uh, but there's still so much beauty that can be told in them. I'm friends with a few comic book people, and... Uh, Greg Pak, for instance, Scott Snyder. And I, I just think that watching them uh, th think still visually and in panels and, and sparse uh, language because, you know, you can't write a novel inside a comic book. It's it's interesting. And I think there's still a lot of stories to be told. We are visual. And I think we neglect that in schools. You know, the first things to go are art and music. But if you never learned words, you would still talk. You know, you'd find a way to communicate. Exactly. Well, I, I was teaching my downstairs neighbor, who's a, a man of a certain age, how to use his new iPhone 6. And we got to the part of the keyboard where I showed him that there's emoji. And he said, I know, grown people send me these. People <laughs> in 50s and 60s send me these. I said, I use them every day. Stickers too. Um, we are using visual communication more than we ever have as humans. And I think that it's it's only going to go up. Line, uh, which is a Japanese app. Uh, WeChat, which is a big, very expensive, uh, multi-billion dollar Chinese app. Uh, Facebook Messenger. There's all these messaging platforms that are way more than what SMS text was in the 90s. And we are much more visual because of this. Do you remember the text-only web? Was it not a sad and lonely place? It was awful. I, I remember having WAP applications uh, when I worked in a wireless telecom company that said any day now we could text a couple of different uh, digits <laughs> and buy a phone with our, you know, buy a Coke with our phone. And That's we just so thought funny. the world was going to change. And, you know, we still don't really buy Cokes with our phone. It's still not that interesting. But we do a lot more with our phones than we ever did. And it's just a you fascinating. Can order pizza with your phone now with the pizza emoji. With a pizza emoji, which is just mind-boggling to me, but I just think that you know that seems to be, according to uh, uh, Harry Dent, I almost said Harvey Dent, which is <laughs> still, according to Harry Dent, um, he says that one of the uh, growth industries in the coming years, because we're about to get crushed, is uh, anything that just sort of simplifies other people's lives. And I think that you know, if you can make an app that will respond to an emoji, you're pretty darn smart. You started in IT, so you appreciate this, but I just want my technology to do what I'm thinking magically somehow. Like I'll go, oh, I didn't mean to click that window just because that was the active window. I was over here thinking about something totally else. My technology should just know that. Maybe someday. No question. And, and, and you know, th those are the days where I kind of rude that I'm a marketer, you know, because I think, what do I do all day? I just say things nicely. You know, <laughs> it, it would be so interesting to, I don't know, to make things like Breather, like my former co-author Julian Smith, who now makes companies instead of books. I think it's interesting that, you know, we can, with our hands, create something that will change an economy, for instance. Chris, where can people learn more about you, get copies of your books, learn more about Owner? Uh, you know what? I would say go to chrisbrogan.com just because that's where all of those things are easy to find. And then swing by ownerfuel.com if you're not satisfied. If <laughs> you're not satisfied. They'll be satisfied, but go to ownerfuel.com anyway. Chris, thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. For more information about Chris, check out chrisbrogan.com or follow him on Twitter at Chris Brogan. And be sure to check out ownerfuel.com and follow at ownerfuel on Twitter as well. Thanks for listening, or watching, here to the very end. This has been the Marketing Smarts Podcast, brought to you by Marketing Profs. I'm your host, Carrie O'Shea-Gorgone. Talk with you next week. Mm -hmm.